Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, welcome to the session, Databricks Lake House, cybersecurity that works smarter, not harder. We'll have last 10 minutes for Q&A. And, &A, and uh, with that, we'll quickly get this session started. Please join me in welcoming Justin Lai, Data Architect, and Robert Lombardi, Director of Product Management at BlackBerry. Please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so who here has heard of BlackBerry? Uh, can you put up your hand? Oh, cool. Judging from the room, good response. Um, so today, my colleague Rob and I will be presenting our journey in building a cybersecurity-focused lake house. A little background about myself. My name is Justin. I'm a data architect at BlackBerry. I'm based in Toronto in Canada. I've been at BlackBerry for over 12 years now. Um, and I've been working in the security field for over 10 years. I more recently have joined the data architecture team and started designing, building, and evolving our cybersecurity focused lake house in AWS and data, with Databricks. Our team is spread all across the world and we support Databricks cybersecurity product for worldwide. Oh, good. There we go. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Robert Lombardi, the director of product management for Silence uh, Endpoint. I started at BlackBerry almost 15 years ago now, uh, with my focus being on hardware platform design uh, and advanced technology projects. I left the engineering field and jumped into product management in 2017, uh, and since then have worked on a varied set of solutions across every major mobile and desktop uh, platform, and all with a focus on cybersecurity. I'm going to start us off here with a bit of stage setting. Uh, as there may be a few of you who aren't fully up to speed with what BlackBerry Silence uh, has been up to in the, uh, in the cybersecurity space as of late. Our mission is focused around ensuring that our customers remain resilient to cyber attacks so that impact to business continuity is eliminated or minimized. Uh, that's a large mission that we've set out for ourselves. So let me show you some of the cornerstone products we have that make it a reality. The first two product lines are Silence Endpoint and Silence Edge with both you have your endpoints and your network fully covered with autonomous defense using Silence AI. BlackBerry UEM uh, and SecuSuite are aligned to BlackBerry's kind of uh, heritage in secure communications, uh, hardened solutions, and enabling workplace productivity. Then we have our newly released Silence Intelligence offering, which allows defenders to stay ahead of attackers in the cybersecurity rat race and BlackBerry Ad Hoc, our critical event management solution to ensure that stakeholders have resilient, reliable, and timely uh, communications when they need it most. And lastly, we have our Silence Guard offering for customers who are looking for additional expertise via uh, an MDR, or managed detection and response, and a plethora of uh, security uh, services to address everything from environment setup and tuning uh, to incident response retainers. Okay, so hopefully uh, that was brief enough uh, that it didn't come across as a, as a sales pitch, but I think the macro context is important to understand the whole picture. One of the big challenges we needed to overcome when getting from where we were to where we are is that our EDR, or Endpoint Detection and Response Solution, needed some significant upgrades in how it stored and accessed security telemetry. In the legacy version of the product, all of the forensics information was held in a local database that was actually stored on the endpoint and was available to a security analyst on demand through the cloud console experiences. This architecture didn't lend itself well for where we wanted to go with the broader uh, security portfolio, as well as where the market was kind of shifting to. So we needed to evolve our solution from local storage to cloud native storage. It all started with a simple ask from product management from myself, uh, actually, as I led this transition on the product side. We needed a better, faster, cheaper cloud-native EDR solution. Uh, wait, that can't be right. Yeah, right, not cheaper. <laughs> that would be crazy talk, since our data hosting uh, costs were very efficient in the old architecture, but we still wanted to make sure um, that it was cost-effective so that we could seamlessly migrate all of our legacy customers forward to the new architecture instead of having to fork the product line and then migrate them to an, uh, an entirely separate offering. We had a whole bunch of goals um, that the new design had to meet. It had to reduce resources used by the endpoint agent, retain data for 30 days out of the box, 
instead of seven or 14, which was kind of commonplace in the market. Um, offer higher reliability and faster response times. Keep our cost competitive uh, nature and allow for more advanced and capable security operations experiences that would also act as core platform components um, that would pave the way for future XDR capabilities. The first version that we spun up used Elasticsearch to drive the majority of the new console experiences and then Databricks as the system of record and long-term storage to be used for internal research uh, of new threats and then other data science and, uh, and machine learning activities. Some of you may already be guessing at what might have worked and one, what didn't uh, from the last slide. And if you also knew uh, that EDR products records a ton of data over the day, that may also help inform uh, that guess. On the good side, we had blazing fast response times for any interaction in the console. We got our new experience up and running for threat hunting that was able to take much better advantage of, uh, of the data being kept in the cloud and then always available versus on-demand access. And we had proven that customers could seamlessly upgrade from the old solution to the new solution with, uh, with zero upgrade friction. But uh, not every swing uh, was a home run. The cost was uh, way, way over budget. Uh, the data models used for driving the experiences versus what we had for internal research were unsynchronized. And there was a lack of analytics capabilities and reporting, meaning that we weren't really taking full advantage of the data that was being held in the Databricks systems. To the surprise of maybe only a few in this room, Elasticsearch wasn't really meeting our needs. It was too expensive, which uh, forced us to be very selective about what data we kept and didn't allow the retention we wanted at the price point that we wanted. We uh, quickly changed course to leverage the systems in Databricks that, had, that already had access to the same data with richer context, but that also came uh, with some growing pains. The cost was better, uh, but not great. Uh, there were performance issues that needed to be uh, overcome as well, and our ingestion pipeline was very unoptimized, which caused unacceptable latency for data access in the console uh, experiences. As you also may have guessed, likely due to the fact that uh, you know, we're here <laughs> talking about this at a Databricks uh, conference, this story does have a happy ending. We worked very closely with a bunch of folks at, uh, at Databricks to help us achieve the desired outcomes we wanted more rapidly. We got our costs to fall in line with the budget, we were able to store all of our data without, uh, without compromise while offering 30-day default retention, meeting all of our performance metrics for the experience, and optimizing the latency um, of data processing and availability. So big thanks to the Databricks team we worked with and, uh, and still do, some of them are in the room. Uh, you know who you are and you're all uh, you know, definitely awesome. Okay, I've got one more slide before handing it off to Justin where he can get kind of into the details for you guys. So where are we going next then? We're working on more streamlined security experiences that are easier to use, smarter, and automate out as much of the redundant workflows as possible um, so humans can spend more time on human needed tasks. Uh, to, to best leverage the data uh, for the customer, we're bringing in richer analytics, uh, insights and reporting, and build up more advanced, higher efficacy models that continue to lead the market in prevention first security. Bringing all of this technology together in a single multi-tenant XDR platform experience so that both our customers and our partners have full access to all of these great enhancements. And with that, I'm gonna stop telling you what we did and why and turn it over to Justin so that he can tell you how it was actually done and what was used. Great, thank you Rob. Wow, that was a lot of marketing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Agenda. Uh, so for today's talk, I'll be covering an overview of building the EDR pipeline using Databricks and the challenge we encounter. Um, meeting data access demand once EDR data became available in the lake. And then finally, data governance using Unity Catalog. So to start, um, our ingestion pipeline in EDR took a while to settle. Our first iteration, as Rob was mentioning, we use the in-house serialization format to encode that's encoded by a client and store in S3. Um, the data is then published to Kafka, where it is picked up by Databricks job, 
The job is internally, uses an internally developed library to deserialize and then write to a bronze delta table. And then after it's written to the delta table, it is streamed to two separate silver job that ingest from the bronze table as well. One silver job publishes the data from Elasticsearch Data Accelerator to power customer facing front end. The second silver job publishes the data into the data lake. The, work, the architecture worked well during the proof of concept stage, but struggled as our data load increased. The pain point came from various places. Um, so on the screen, uh, it came from the Kafka, um, scaling of the Kafka, and then also Elasticsearch, as Rob was pointing out before. Uh, one was Kafka, as I mentioned before. Um, we ended up trimming our Kafka stream in favor of just directly ingesting the data from, via autoloader from S3. Um, the latter, actually, that evolved into a combination of Kinesis and S3 for ingestion. That minimized, basically, the number of S3 API call needed on the client side, we started serializing, instead we abandoned our in-house developed serialization library and to start leveraging JSON with broadly compression instead to better leverage autoloader and the schema inference capability of Databricks. So after settling, after settling our ingestion issues, we switched focus to optimizing presenting our data to the customer. Based on early customer engagement and feedback, we realized Elasticsearch was an overkill. So we swapped out our Elasticsearch Accelerator in favor of, the, of querying the data directly from Databricks. We worked closely with our Databricks account team, Deegan, Meyer, and Tao, to tune the pipeline. We tuned the setting within OLO to ensure our ingestion from SQRSQ kept up with the rate of data coming in. We then implemented, Databricks team then provided some suggestion for us on the, for the SQL warehouse to minimize the query time through effective partitioning of our data and also implemented a query size limit to help maximize the number of concurrent queries that could happen within a SQL warehouse. We collaborated on designing our Delta table to ensure our customer query time is within our service level agreement. Databricks pipeline basically made, a, made it much, very simple for us to refactor our pipeline on the fly on the back end. Um, with the pipeline now settled, we could focus our energy on bringing additional data sources to enrich and support our EDR solution. Development roadmap. So where are we going with our EDR pipeline? Um, future enhancement of pipeline includes optimization, such as S3 tiering for archiving old data. Um, so that's mainly used for threat research and machine learning. Um, so that's to optimize so we can store years worth of data at a lower cost. Improve query response time, especially during busy period, using SQL wireless. wireless. SQL serverless cluster so that it's sub seven second uh, spin up time and also quicker to scale time. We have all started exploring using Delta Live Table for improving pipeline management and improving our auto scaling capability during ingestion as well. And finally, to bring in additional data to augment our EDR table and for our XDR solution. Opening up our data lake. Next, we'll talk about the process of opening our, our data lake for the rest of the company. We accomplished this by implementing the following. Workspace separation, Terraform to manage our data lake deployment, establishing design and code patterns for others to leverage, and data governance using Unity Catalog. Here's a high level overview of our data source. Before data break, getting access to the data involved using different database access pattern and submitting multiple access requests for approval, it can get tedious to always be cautious running queries on production databases. And also, just trying to track down where the data is located, how to access it. For example, data stored in S3. As you can see in the diagram, our product data do not reside in a single environment. Our endpoint detection reside in one, could be, could be stored in a AWS, separate AWS account from our control data or from our EDR data. They were really disjointed. And on top of that, it, the data could take various forms. So it could be in a format for RDS, it could be in S3, it could be in Kafka or Kinesis, and all have different storage retention, data retention periods. This made it challenging for, for our, this made it challenging to combine our data together for machine learning, business analytic, or threat hunt. We needed a common workspace. With Databricks, our user 
who are interested in our product data and enrichment can just go to one place and start viewing, querying, and interacting with our data in a common format, Delta. Having a lake house also enable our team to start collecting internal user query to better understand how our data is being used and not used. The data is then used to create goal table to more, to more commonly improve the search performance. We didn't need to build our data lake from the ground up because Databricks provided the tooling for us to just focus on the data. <clears throat> Blackwood deployment of Databricks leverages Git as source control for our notebooks. Terraform for deploying the infrastructure such as Workflow, SQL Warehouse, Unity Catalog Permission, and Unity Catalog Permission Management. Our internal user signs on from a single user portal, and data access is governed by Unity Catalog. Workspace separation. Our common workspace was envisioned as kind of like a safe way for a user to query the data being brought into the lake without impacting production system. This, you can say this is kind of like an early version toward of our path to, as a data platform. Initially, we limit all our users to just a SQL portion of the workspace. Over time, we started opening up the data, data science and engineering section to individuals from different teams to preview, and just to get an idea how to make it work at a larger scale. We finally opened up the, the workspace for, every, for all individuals to use. This was made possible because of Unity Catalog. It enabled us to create a consistent permission model defined in a meta store and enforced everywhere. So, in the SQL workspace and in the data engineering session, they could all the same permission. The high-level goal of the common workspace is, that, is to enable engineers to build pipeline against the data being collected without being dependent on the data architecture team. We simply just could not scale as the rest of the company start making data requests. The data architecture team provides a core data set and oversight of the workspace using dashboard and alerts for as monitoring tools. We only step in when, the, when help is required. Terraform. Our team was already leveraging Terraform as part of the process of setting up Databricks to power EDR. Um, over time, we made our Terraform module more flexible, so deployment was easier. Um, we, had, we adopted a flexible deployment strategy to keep up with how quickly Databricks Terraform provider was changing as they incrementally improve it upon it. Um, part of that strategy was to create integration template that must be updated as the module evolve. This ensure engineer picks up the latest and greatest Terraform module changes when creating new infrastructure. We also adopt a policy to update existing infrastructure only when it needs to change. This shortened the amount of regression testing needed and operational impact changed if when a module does change. During the Terraform journey, we also identified some infrastructure within Databricks are quite dynamic in nature and didn't quite make sense to be Terraform. Those elements, such as the general purpose cluster, were tagged to be ignored. So certain fields within the cluster, such as the type and the cluster size, those are fairly dynamic based on use case. So what we did was we, we implemented a life cycle to ignore those fields within a Terraform. So when we do make structural changes to the deployment, it doesn't always come back as conflicted. Recently, we, started also started, we also started using personal compute policy for a user to create their own cluster with proper tagging and restriction already built into the policy. This self-service model enables our internal user to spin up cluster that suits their need when they need it, while also providing proper data, proper governance on the resource being used so that everything is tracked, everything is tracked with the cost and, every, and we can help identify which team use what. In addition to flexible Terraform policy within Daybricks, our team also created general storage for engineers to use for, de for development. Um, those, those storage bucket automatically cleans up after 30 to 60 days. This helps, this automated cleanup helps basically what needs to be done to the manual done, hmm, sorry. This helps automate cleanup activity that in the past needed to be manually done or never at all. With the, with, with the infrastructure now set up, we turn our focus to documentation and creation of the ingestion pattern to help newly onboarded data engineer to use our lake house. Establishing patterns. We, we create a collection of Spark extraction, transform, and low pattern in Git and deploy them in a shared directory within our workspace. 
we notify our user of these patterns via an operating wiki as part of the registration process when they sign up for Databricks access. These template, uh, this template and patterns are grouped by the use cases where it's typically needed. In our case, we started off with bronze, silver, and gold. Gradually, we, ex we expanded to provide more specialized templates for problems not specific to the medallion architecture. It is important to note that these patterns are recommendation only, and it's meant to accelerate the development of a new pipeline. It's not set in stone. As an example of this, this Kafka template on the screen here shows, how, shows our user how to read a commonly used Kafka stream within our infrastructure and what Spark API to call to decode the data. Um, before this template existed, it could have really helped some of our onboarding engineers, which I'll show in the next slide what they did. All I wanted to do was transform protobuf to a data frame. This was an example of one of our en en early engineers trying to decode a protobuf message from Kafka into a data frame. The developer started with a Python library to read in Kafka, ingested the data, but then transformed the data using protobuf classes that he manually imported ma in individually. He runs decode to decode the protobuf string, convert it to a map, and then convert that into a data frame. This code ended up using PySpark data frame, but it completely bypassed taking advantage of st structured streaming, and obviously it didn't scale well at all. Establishing patterns help our engineers solve commonly encountered problems in day-to-day -day work. What we found so far based on feedback with our template was it helped alleviate frustration, saves time, and stop the reinvention of the wheel. So we don't get six different implementations of reading from a Kafka stream, all slightly different. Another good example where pattern could help are in situation where we naturally want to use for loop on a data frame, which is a bad practice. This often results in a good, quick Google search resulting in the use of collect being used and then chaos ensue when the data frame is too large. So 60 gig of data on a single cluster, it will just crash. With the infrastructure process and documentation now ready, we can start onboarding more and more user. In the next section, I'll talk about the different use cases that have started appearing on Lake House. Dashboarding. We begin the journey by opening up our SQL portion of our common Databricks workspace. We expected the, uh, dashboarding to be very successful because internally we use dashboarding to visualize and analyze the data coming in from our early ingestion pipeline for EDR. Dashboarding within the common workspace grew steadily as users begin onboarding. So as you can see, we opened up our common workspace back in around November 2021 as EDR pipeline was being built. Um, we finally, as the product was deployed and as more users onboard, we saw a steady rate of just creation of dashboard throughout the year until now. This, this basically led to a diverse set of dashboard being created. Some example use cases. There are many great examples of dashboard around common workspace. Our Fred Hunter created a comprehensive dashboard breaking down Fred in a visual way and often share the output internally and externally to our customers. An expected use case that came out of our cybersecurity lighthouse was visualization of costs. We opened up the common workspace to the business team to, to see Databricks costs initially. They liked it so much, they asked us to bring in all the AWS cloud costs as well from Athena. The business team combined the cost data into a goal table and then published itself to the preferred tool of choice to use for, for the downstream. Beyond dashboard, some of our more enterprising users have started exploring other features within the SQL work, workspace, such as SQL alerts. Alert for threat huntings. BlackBerry Threat Research Team was one of the first team to be onboarded on user, uh, to use Databricks. Dashboarding was great for viewing and pulling data, but our user needed a push mechanism to notify them when interesting events are occurring. The team needed a local way to identify interesting data produced by EDR product. Um, so our threat hunters are not Python programmer. They know SQL and that was it, so they needed a local way. They leveraged Databricks alert feature to notify them when interesting events occur. Alert is generated. Data is then captured and integrated into our existing threat research workflow. Beyond dashboard and alert, our threat research team share started requesting more complex workflow. This led to a collaboration between the data architecture team and the threat research team. Out of the collaboration, we created a hybrid pipeline that powered threat research binary analysis work workflow. 
I will, know, I will not go into specific, specific detail on how we got to this design. The topic was enough, has enough material for another talk. We've configured a general purpose cluster to load DAS and open source Python library for parallel computing. DAS is loaded into the driver and the worker along with an appropriate Python library to run internal analysis. The pipeline collects FRED data from Unity catalog, reduce the data set before passing the collected list for DAS for process. Um, the computer result, computer result from DAS is then passed back and written into Unity catalog to be shared with others. BlackBerry research, FRED research team can then have the option to feed the data to our product directly or create dashboard or share this FRED intel to our data science team through Unity catalog. Databricks open approach enables us to create pipelines simply by leveraging a few important features. Um, those features are init script, access to Databricks file system, and the command line within the notebooks. <clears throat> Many small steps led to our lake house. Um, supporting EDR enable our customer to hunt using data collected in the lake, resulting in the lake, data lake being built. Um, over time, FRED research, data science, business analytic team started to leverage Databricks as part of their day-to-day -day workflow. It all started in SQL Data Explorer to visualize data and evolve into building pipelines that are managed by other teams. We encountered growing pain along the way, but we were able to leverage the resource of the Spark community and Databricks to solve them. The usage of cybersecurity focus like how spread internally via word of mouth, a common workspace environment provided a safe place to access production data for a new user to explore. And it's now an incubator for new ideas. Unity catalogs. Um, our Unity catalog journey started back in October 2021. 20, we were one of the very first adopters of Unity catalog. Um, and we, we really picked up steam in 2022 and 2023. In this section, I'll go over Unity, how Unity Catalog is enabling us to organize and share data across region. <clears throat> Our role plan was to have Unity Catalog implemented in staging and common workspace for management of our data. Um, we realized really early on, it would be a major effort to update all of our existing jobs to support Unity Catalog. So we adopted a process that ensure all the Hive Metastore data are captured in the Unity catalog as a first step. In addition, we mandate data support for a new pipeline to have single user security access more supported and to only publish to Unity catalog. As of June, 20, as of June 2023, all E2 workspace have Unity catalog enabled for table and data management. However, our, our, journey, our journey is still ongoing since we have no easy way to update old queries in a, in a bulk manner that still reference Hive to use the new UC path. We must still coexist with both until the migration of all the queries and existing dependency are, is complete. What you see here is a representation of how our data is organized worldwide. Our meta store are broken down by region, USA, Canada, Asia 1, Asia 2, Europe, South America. We have workspace for development, staging, and, product, and production environments. And we will be leveraging workspace isolation to ensure staging data and production catalogs are kept isolated in the correct workspace. As of today, we still have two PVC instances that are not Unity catalog enabled. We plan to be PVC free by the end of the year. Unity catalog enable our team to manage permission in a consistent manner across the workspace using groups and table and catalogs produced by our workflow are automatically visible to, to our read-only workspace simply because it shares the same metastore. This lessens the overhead our engineer has to take when creating reference to our external table in the common workspace, which we used to do with Hive Metastore. Next, I'll talk about a common naming convention within Unity Catalog. As I mentioned before, we have a regional metastore um, and leverage workspace separation to control catalog visibility in different workspace. Um, this ensure environment don't cross contaminate, staging data stays staging, staging stays in the staging workspace. Our catalogs are defined by product name and then the environment. So environment would be staging, production, and dev. Our schema, pro our schema has three generic categories, bronze, silver, and gold, but could vary quite a bit depending on the type of catalog it is. Our our S3 bucket naming convention is a prefix denoting the bucket it belongs to the data lake, the product, and then the environment, as I mentioned before, and the region the data is captured and stored in. 
So in this case, it would be US, Europe, Asia, and South America. With Unity Catalog deployed, we now have a defined method to provide a single panel view of data across all region, which I'll talk about next. Delta sharing. Our internal user of the common workspace needed access to more than just data from one region. They wanted to see and work with all the data in a single workspace worldwide. This is a challenging problem that required us to work closely with other teams within BlackBerry organization to make sure we are in compliance of regional data law and EULA. Together with the, data, with the privacy and data protection team, we created guidelines and pattern on using Delta Share to share data between region. Through Delta Sharing, our region Metastore will share its data with the common workspace Metastore. Catalog isolation and permission will limit access to only the common workspace. In addition, we have added auditing within, our, within the common workspace to identify and stop sharing, share regional data from being put to rest in the common workspace. Why did we pick Delta Sharing? Um, Mostly because of the read-only read nature um, the, and the way the data access is governed. It's basically, it belongs to the regional Metastore. You, you grant access, you revoke access from that region Metastore, not from the common Metastore. Um, we provided, we explored various options we provide, to basically provide common workspace within each region, but that didn't really satisfy the single workspace requirement of basically seeing everything in one workspace and one dashboard. Um, data access is controlled by the regional access meta story, which is nice since we don't have to contaminate our US one meta story with, let's say, IAM, IAM role that are govern, govern read access to the other regions, S3 bucket. Less chance of an accident happening. The future. Um, the data collected with our cybersecurity lake, lake house will be power We'll be powering a future product and features such as XDR, and data bricks will play an important role in our day to day, in the day to day of our engineering data scientists and machine learning engineers. We're working toward providing Lakehouse access to all BlackBerry employees and, and development teams to develop and own the pipeline and the data they built. In this model, data architecture team will provide a core set of data, local ingestion patterns, and governance to ensure data is extracted, transformed, and loaded efficiently. And of course, we'll also continue to enforce the mantra to always publish the data back to the lake so that we have a positive feedback loop. We also aim to complete the UC migration to leverage new and exciting feature announced during the Data and AI Summit. Finally, we aim to integrate our machine learning workflow and with Databricks for model training and model serving purposes as well. Um, this concludes our presentation. We would like to give a special thank to our Databrick account team, Tao, Meyer, and Deegan for supporting us on the journey from since the beginning. We are now opening up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Justin and Robert, for that amazing presentation. Any questions? <laughs>